Okay, so breaking news in from College Board, the new information about the exam has been published finally. So changes to the test. The test is going to take place on May 11th at noon, meaning it starts at noon. So you need to be ready to go at noon. So you should have your note card, not your note card, your exam formula sheet and your TI 89 calculator ready to go at like 1140. The actual test starts at noon. You'll take it at home on a computer and then you'll upload work for the open-ended or you'll answer it directly on the computer. Um, we're, we're still working that out with Mr. Wilson. So as that information is kind of given, I will update you. There is a makeup exam date for June 1st at noon. So if you have another AP exam going on or I think that you can amend to take it June 1st, um, you can have more time to study, but I suggest you take it May 11th because most of the units we've already covered and we don't want to wait too long before we uh, take the test. So the topic outlines were already spoken about in the video I initially posted, but I'm just going to go through it again really quick. And then this resource is also linked in Google Classroom on the assignment. So unit one is kinematics. These percentages are no longer valid. So a unit could be on the test, could be the entire test, or could not be on the test. We have no idea. So unit one kinematics covers one dimensional and two dimensional motion. So one dimensional motion, average velocity, average acceleration, two dimensional motion could be projectile motion, okay? constant acceleration, that kind of information. Unit two is Newton's laws. So section one is the first and second law. Section two is circular motion. And then section three is the third law. Work, energy, and power. So right now we're working on section one, which is the work energy theorem. We covered three dash two, which is potential energy and force. So that is pretty broad in general there. So although simple harmonic motion is not on the AP exam, Hooke's law and elastic potential energy could be on the exam because of that broad phrasing there and the broad objectives in the, um, the outline. So although simple harmonic motion is not on the test, Hooke's law and gravitational potential, elastic potential, that, that's all fair game. Conservation of energy, which we've already talked about. And then the last section in that unit is power, which we're getting to. So we have two, two sections in that unit that we are still working on. Unit four is systems of particles and linear momentum. So center of mass, impulse and momentum, conservation of linear momentum, and types of collisions. Okay, unit five is rotation. So torque and rotational statics rotational kinematics, rotational dynamics and energy, so rotational kinetic energy, torque equals I times alpha, angular momentum and conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so technically simple harmonic motion and universal gravitation will not be on the AP exam, but gravitational potential energy and elastic potential energy are still fair game because of this clause right here. So we will review those when we begin to review. Okay, and we have about a month before the AP exam. So exam timing, you will have 25 minutes to answer the first question and then five minutes to upload your response to that question. After uploading the response to question one, you will have 15 minutes to respond to question two. Okay, and then you'll have five additional minutes to upload your response to question two. In order to move on to question two, you must submit the answer to question one. Once you submit the answer to question one, you cannot go back to it. Okay, so unlike the open-ended from previous years and the types that we've practiced, once you complete a question, you cannot go backwards. Okay, you have unequal amounts of time to work on each question. So question one, you have 25 minutes. Question two, you have 15 minutes. 
Therefore, question one is worth 60% of your exam and question two is worth 40%. Again, we don't know which topics they are, but they do give us information about the types of questions. So in order to stop plagiarism, okay, the questions will be very different than previous years. So um, we're going to talk about those types of questions. And we're going to have to practice answering those types of questions. So it's not going to be the typical derivation of a specific value in terms of combinations of equations. It's more conceptual. So that first question, it's actually never been on a previous AP exam. Um, the example they referenced is from an AP1 exam. So we have never practiced a question like that before. So we're going to spend a little bit of time doing that. Lucky for us, uh, because it's conceptual, it's going to probably take a little bit less time. Um, but again, we're, we're going to practice applying the concepts without looking at the, the equations. So that first question, you'll have to analyze representations of situations, determine scientific questions and methods, analyze quantitative data that could be represented in graphs or tables, develop an explanation or an argument. So we are actually familiar with that. And when we look at the example from the AP1 exam, it's actually very similar to the last open-ended on your uh, test. It's just no equations. The second type of question is very unfamiliar to the APC exam as well. So it's not a question that's commonly on that exam. Uh, the last time a question like this has been asked was the 2012 exam which I'm going to date myself here, but that's the AP exam that I took when I was a senior in high school. Um, that year, because it's primarily conceptual, uh, open-ended questions, the score was pretty low, historic low. So for a five, uh, the range was a 54 to a 90. So a 54 um, was a hundred, I mean, a 54 was a five, which means an A. Um, 42 to 53 was a 4, so you can get a 42, you can get a 4, 33 to 41 is a 3. So in our class, right, when we take these practice exams, we usually score, we always score, every person in our class scores higher than a 33 out of 90. So with that being said, we can expect maybe that the overall curve will be a little bit on the lower side. So instead of a 65 being a 5, a 54 is a 5. Uh, we definitely have the opportunity to score well on this exam. Okay, from our pa pra past performance, I know that we're, we will be able to do this. So please do not let the unfamiliar types of questions throw you off. You know this information. We're going to practice applying it in this way, and we're going to be fine. Okay, we're going to do great on this AP exam. There's nothing to stress about. Some review resources that are linked in the document. So if you want to get a head start, um, there's a college board playlist, which as they post videos, I am linking them to the particular unit and section. Flipping Physics also has a playlist of review videos that it's really good. He's a super interesting guy to listen to and he has really good examples that kind of stick with you. So we will go through a few of these review videos once we begin reviewing for the AP exam, but feel free to get a jump start. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at the suggested examples that College Board had emailed the instructors and you guys are actually going to do them and then we're going to review them. So in classroom, you will see the sample open-ended questions. Okay, and I marked them up a little bit, determining this first question is 60% of the test. You have 25 minutes to do it, five minutes to upload the work. Okay, so as you see, this question looks familiar, right? This physical situ situation looks very familiar. When you look at this diagram, you're probably thinking angular momentum, right? 
And you are exactly right. But instead of looking at the equations, we are going to conceptually, using evidence, answer each part of this question. Okay, so the left end of a rod of length D and rotational inertia I is attached to a frictionless horizontal surface by a frictionless pivot as shown above. Point C marks the center, aka midpoint of the rod or the center of mass. The rod is initially motionless, but is free to rotate around a pivot. A student will slide a disc of mass M sub disc from the rod with velocity V naught perpendicular to the rod. Okay, so that wording there, perpendicular, tells us something about torque, right? It means that the torque is going to be, the force applied will be directly proportional to the radius, or directly perpendicular to the radius. And the disc will stick to the rod at a distance x from the pivot. So that distance x is basically what we call r, and the distance d is what we call l. The student wants the rod disc system to end up with as much angular speed as possible, as much angular momentum. So as you move through the questions, right, parts A, B, C, you notice that it says explain briefly without manipulating equations. Explain briefly your reasoning without deriving an equation for omega. So what they mean is that Driving the equation is not sufficient to answering the question. You must explain, describe in words your result. Okay, so the reason why they're doing this is to stop plagiarism, right? If it's just an equation as an answer, you guys could be on the phone with each other telling each other the equation. If you have to explain in words the answer, it's more likely that you understand it. So this is different than what we typically do on a test, but the concepts are virtually the same and we know this information well. So we're just gonna practice applying our knowledge in this type of way. Okay, um, again, part C, does this physically make sense? Briefly explain without driving the correct equation. You can derive the correct equation. You can use the equations to help you. Just don't write that down as the answer. Okay, explain it in words without writing just down just the equation down. Okay, so that first question would be something like that would have been on your last test, except the way that you're responding is a little bit different. So we're going to give that a try, and then you're going to watch the video after you've tried it yourself that goes through each part, and you're going to correct your answers. Okay, question two, which was on the 2012 exam, is 40% of the test. You have 15 minutes to answer and five to upload. So this is an interesting question. Okay, luckily we've done a lot of labs this year, and in general, um, our group, you guys are really good at critically thinking and pretty good at experimentation. So I'm pretty confident that we're going to be able to do this. But this is different than previous tests, okay? We've never seen a question like this. So you are to perform an experiment investigating the conservation of mechanical energy involving a transformation from initial gravitational potential to translational kinetic energy. Basically, what they're saying is you're going to have an object on top of a ramp that starts with gravitational potential energy and ends with kinetic energy. We're pretending it's frictionless because it translates down the incline. It doesn't roll. There is no rotational kinetic energy. Okay, and the entire purpose of the lab is to investigate conservation of mechanical energy to see if it's conserved. So you're given a concept. You're now going to design an experiment, think about what data you'd collect, and then do some error analysis. So you're given the equipment listed below, all of the supports required to hold the equipment and a lab table. 
on the list below indicate each piece of equipment you would use by checking the line next to each item. So you're, you're walking up to a table with all of these pieces of equipment. Select the ones that you would need to use in order to perform the lab. So again, in 2012, there was no logger pro. Okay, there were no motion detectors. We didn't have that in a classroom in 2012. We used timers, meter sticks, etc. So this item list might be a little bit more advanced considering the time. Um, so it might be a little bit more obvious to you which pieces of equipment you might um, grab here. Okay, um, but you're gonna check off the items in which you would need to use in order to perform the lab. Okay, part B, outline a procedure for performing the experiment. Include a diagram of your experimental setup. Label the equipment in your diagram. Also include a description of the measurements you would take and make an symbol for each measurement. So here basically it wants you to draw the setup, create a procedure. So step one, gather the material. Step two, measure the height of the incline above the table, the mass of the cart the length of the track, right? So you're literally writing a procedure and then you want a description of what you're gonna measure. So what's your independent variable, your dependent variable, write down the variables, the units, okay? Um, what's your constant variables? So which variables will be controlled? And especially for your procedure, right? You have 15 minutes, so you need to have enough information to get points for writing down a detailed procedure of how you'll collect the data, but you don't want to spend too much time that you run out of time. Okay, so you're literally designing your own experiment to prove this concept. Part C, give a detailed account of the calculations of gravitational potential and translational kinetic energy before and after in terms of the quantities measured in part B. So basically you need to explain how you will calculate gravitational potential energy based on what you measured, how you will calculate translational kinetic energy based on what you measured before and after. C, or excuse me, part D, after your first trial, so after you do the calculations, suppose your calculations show that the energy increased during the experiment meaning that you have more kinetic energy at the bottom of the ramp than potential energy you had at the top. But assuming that that error isn't due to any mathematical mistake you made, give a reasonable explanation for how this could have occurred. So how could you have more kinetic energy at the bottom than potential energy at the top based on what you measured? So you're thinking about logically how that could have happened, what error that would be due to in the performance of the lab, but it cannot be a human error, meaning, and again, do not use the word human error in a justification of lab error. Do not say human error. Okay, humans make lots of errors. You need to be specific. So it's not a mathematical error. What component of the lab setup or the actual performance of the lab could have occurred so that you had more kinetic energy at the end than potential in the beginning? You're explaining that. Part E, in all the other trials, your calculations show that the energy decreased during the experiment, meaning you had less kinetic energy on the bottom than you had potential energy on top. Again, assuming you made no mathematical errors, given a reasonable physical explanation for the fact that the average energy you, deter you determined decreased. Okay, and now they give you a hint. Include references to conservative and non-conservative forces as appropriate. So we actually haven't gotten to this yet. We talk about the difference between a conservative and a non-conservative force in the work unit. Really what it means is conservative forces means that mechanical energy is conserved. 
So if a conservative force is applied, mechanical energy is conserved. If a non-conservative force is applied, like friction, air resistance, mechanical energy is not conserved. So they're kind of giving you a hint there, right? We're assuming that all of the potential energy is converted directly to translational kinetic energy. If the translational kinetic energy is less than the gravitational potential energy we started with, what could that be due to? What would be physically in the system that we're ignoring that could result in an error, okay? Mathematical errors cannot be your explanation. All right, so to start off kind of better understanding this exam, you're gonna try these two questions. I suggest that you maybe print them and do the work um, and upload them, or you can do an online paper up to you. Once you're done, okay, you're going to let me know and I will give you access to the solutions. Okay, but I wanna see that you try it by yourself first. Just do the best that you can. Remember, a 54 is a five. A 54 is a five. And you guys know this information really well. Just do the best that you can. Okay, and maybe try and stick to the time suggestions. Okay, and you're gonna send me an email or comment on the post when you're done, and I will give you access to the solutions. All right, guys, um, talk to you soon.